Welcome, Aubrey, and welcome all the viewers. Uh, look, we have um, a great line uh, discussion um, forthcoming today. Aubrey is the um, the president of uh, New Technology Discovery if, at Ajax, if I said that correctly, and also the chief science officer at SENS Foundation. Welcome. It's great to have you here again. Thanks very much for being with us today, Aubrey. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Well, um, last time we uh, discussed a number of things, but one of the interesting um, things that I've been watching is progress towards achieving um, sort of the mouse rejuvenation, um, the robust mouse rejuvenation model. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, how, how are we going in that respect? Do you think we're getting closer Last time you said we were somewhere like five to six years away from achieving um, robust mouse rejuvenation. Are you still um, have that sort of credence in mind? Are you still confident that we're going to achieve that in, you know, in the next five to six years? Yes, I am. In fact, I would say that at this point, um, my 50-50 guess would be something more like three years from now. Wow. It's, it's really going well right now. The, there are a couple of things that have led me to become progressively more optimistic over the past couple of years. The first one is just the general progress, the fact that even the most difficult components of sense are now moving forward pretty damn fast. And we'll probably talk, want to talk about that in the rest of this interview. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, there's a lot to, um, to look at, but no, it, it's going very nicely. But there's one specific thing that has made me very much more optimistic, and this applies not only to robust mass rejuvenation, but also to the longer term goal of robust human rejuvenation. And that is what we're seeing with senolytics, with the elimination of senescent cells using drugs or other technologies. The thing that has really surprised me, and I think it surprised everybody, even the people who are working on it, is how widespread, how wide ranging the benefits are of removing senescent cells. We've always known since the beginning of sense, since the beginning of the idea that we should tackle aging as a divide and conquer problem, um, we've always known that there would be crosstalk between the different therapies, that if you eliminate one type of damage, repair one type of damage, then the rate at which the other types of damage accumulate will be somewhat reduced because the body will just be in a better state to, 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 to optimize its damage repair mechanisms that it already has. But what we didn't know was the magnitude of that crosstalk. It was historically reasonable to suppose that actually there would not be all that much crosstalk. Um, maybe with one exception, namely mitochondrial mutations, which I've always believed have a very ubiquitous, very pervasive impact on everything else. But everything else, you know, I would say, you know, we would have thought that, you know, you fix it and that's good in one or two places, but basically a lot of other things just proceed more or less at the normal rate, at the standard speed, and therefore people are going to die or mice are going to die pretty much on schedule. And it seems that senescent cells are another example where that's not the case, where the the attenuation, the, slow, the retardation of aging, of the accumulation of other types of damage, of all other types of damage, seems to be quite substantial. And of course, this means that we have a good chance of achieving robust mouse rejuvenation and indeed robust human rejuvenation with somewhat more imperfect, more incomplete versions of sense than what we might historically have expected. Right, yes. Yeah. So last time you said you were quite impressed with two of the aspects of the SENS approach, which um, looked to be some of the most hardest parts to defeat, and that was the mito, um, the uh, the extracellular cross-linking and the mitochondrial mutations there. I did an interview with um, Oysen Biotechnology about the their, um, their approach there, and they looked as though at the time they were doing quite promisingly um, but there's been some other um, developments as well. Is there any specific developments or um, that you think is uh, 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 worth bringing up at this time? Like, 
Uh, well, um, on the senescent cell side of things, which is, of course, where Ocean are doing their work, um, I would say, no, it's not that there's one specific thing. The strength that we have right now is precisely from the diversity. In fact, there's at least half a dozen different approaches that are being taken to eliminate senescent cells, all very promising and very different from each other, which means that we have robustness in this system. It means that if any one particular approach ends up running into the sand for whatever reason, you know, ends up having bad side effects or being technically too difficult, doesn't matter because one of the other approaches is very likely to move forward without such problems. Um, and of course, the same is true with regard to investment. The fact that synolytics, senescent cell elimination in general, is really, you know, spectacularly successful right now in terms of bringing in very substantial amounts of money um, from investors, from um, you know, visionary angel investors who are willing to do high risk, high reward stuff. And, you know, it's, it's, it's floating all boats. It's bringing everything up. It's making people really believe that rejuvenation biotechnology is a thing. Fantastic. Yeah, well, as regards the, uh, um, the, the, the most difficult components of sense, the ones that you just mentioned, mitosense and glycosense, yeah, I mean, progress has very much continued. Um, the situation with extracellular cross-linking is that the group that we have funded for the past several years at Yale University have now spun out their work into a company. Uh, it's called Revel, R-E-V-E-L, and it's going to be well-funded. Um, many of our standard um, you know, usual suspects on the investor side have been very interested in it, and that's all. You know, it, in fact, it should have happened a, while, a few months, a good few months ago. But as you know, these things are often a little bit um, difficult at the fi at the last minute in terms of you know getting proper um, approval from the university that's involved. That's pretty much done now. Fantastic. Last time you spoke about um, also teaming up with Buck Institute, Judy, uh, uh, Judy Campisi, um, and that was also focusing on senescent cells. Um, how's that been going? Sure. So actually, we've been working closely with Judy and funding her group uh, for several years already. And one of our board members, Kevin Perris, just finished his PhD uh, in Judy's group. Hmm. But we are funding that group still um, actually at a somewhat elevated level uh, a new project focused on trying to encourage the immune system to be better at eliminating senescent cells and that's now become a project that we actually are doing jointly with part of it happening in judy's lab and part of it happening in our own lab down in mountain view um uh, but that's not all we're doing at the buck we also have another project in another lab julie anderson's lab Julie is a very accomplished and respected researcher in neurodegeneration. Most of her focus over the years has been in Parkinson's disease, but actually what we're doing with her is on Alzheimer's disease. We're looking at repurposing our lysosense technology where we take bacterial enzymes and we break stuff down, repurposing that to target the aggregates that accumulate in neurons in Alzheimer's, those are called tangles, made mainly of a protein called hyperphosphorylated tau. Mm. And it's a more challenging target than the other things that we've been so successful with, the um, derivatives of vitamin A that drive macular degeneration and also the oxidized cholesterol derivatives that drive atherosclerosis. It's more challenging than that, but we think we can do it. So that's happening now. But I want to actually say something more about the buck because it's not just the specific project that we're doing. We are, we have a fantastic relationship with the buck. This all began with Brian Kennedy, who of course ran the Buck Institute for a number of years. And uh, during his tenure there, we developed very deep and close relations with them. But also, since Brian left, and his, as you know, he's mainly now in Singapore, um, running an extremely promising and important new institute, Center for, he for Healthy Longevity there. Um, since that time, his successor, Eric Verdun, who is originally French-Canadian, and um, that's why he's got a French name, of course, um, he's someone that I had not really had very much interaction with until he started at the bar. But he and I have become great friends over the past couple of years. And we are really working strongly with the Buck as a team. 
uh, with them being able to take a more, if you like, mainstream establishment position um, and, that, and me carrying on basically, you know, pushing the envelope and saying things that other people can't say because I have more independence and freedom from the standard, you know, peer reviewed grant application world and you know, people who are ultimately highly conservative and think I'm crazy. Um, you know, I can I can live with that. So yes, um, the, 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 the relationship between sense foundation and the bark is extremely important and extremely healthy right now. Fantastic. And I think last thing, last time we spoke about trying to get, get people, not necessarily converting them from being complete skeptics or completely against the idea, but just nudging them a little bit more towards the center. Um, and for those who are on the fence, nudging them just a little bit over towards um, desirability, uh, the side of the desirability, because really, I mean, um, not many people would argue that in principle, if we could stay healthy for a longer period of time and and um, do everything that we really enjoy while we still have our health with it, that would be a bad thing. Um, so it seems as though like you've been making progress in the right areas um, and look, it's so great that uh, it seems as though your credences have been improved with regard to achieving robust mouse rejuvenation. And that, yeah. that is actually... One thing, I, one thing I want to say is you will often see the mainstream of gerontology saying things that I said years ago um, and not giving me much credit. In fact, essentially ignoring me. And a lot of people think that this is a problem, you know, that... that um, that it's unfair or, you know, that I should be getting more prominence and credit. That's completely wrong. That's misguided. It is actually a very good thing that the grandees, the mainstream people are doing what they're doing and, and kind of staying away from me. Because what they are doing thereby is allowing them to use their establishment credentials to the maximum, you know, to actually make sure that you know, people who don't understand this field at all actually pay attention. I want them, I want these people to ignore me uh, when they're in, in terms of public pressure. And, you know, some people get confused about that. They think, you know, um, that somehow this is not the way things ought to be, but it, it really is. And in private, these, you know, these mainstream people who are following my lead, so to speak, um, are totally appreciative that, you know, I'm making a huge, I'm, I'm giving huge value by being out there and, and, you know, taking all the bullets, so to speak, that I can take and they can't, and generally, you know, forging the way ahead. Well, that's fantastic. And, and I, I totally hats off to you for that, because, I mean, a lot of people do um, want to, I guess, hold the mantle for as long as possible. Um, and always but it would be the person in the spotlight or, you know, um, be recognized. But, you know, um, I think the outcome of all the effort that you've done is surely showing them, showing itself out there. Um, and maybe um, not all of it is uh, duly um, credited to your efforts. But, I mean, it's great that you think like that. Um, and, look, yes, I'm very impressed with what you've been doing. So... Uh, what what has um, Sands been focusing on? I mean, you've been focusing on the molecular side. Last time you mentioned that um, you also focus. Uh, uh, you've got a different focus at Ajax Therapeutics with Mike West, where they're focusing more on the um, the cellular side. So I'd be very interested to see um, what kind of progress has been made in these two fronts. Right. Okay. So let me start first with Sands. So as you know, over the past few years, our uh, if you like, our business model has somewhat evolved uh, because it has been able to. Essentially, we have got into the position where we've been able to attract much more money for our projects um, than we were in the past. And the reason we've been able to is by spinning these projects out into startup companies. There are people out there who are quite you know, visionary. They understand that this is the next thing they really want to get involved but they really don't like giving money away so if you can give them an investment opportunity even if it's a really high risk high reward one they're much happier to write big checks and so we've now done this half a dozen times spinning out um projects into startup companies they're all doing well and that is really a fantastic situation 
But we're still a few years away from the point where the foundation, the nonprofit, can, if you like, you know, declare victory um, and just kind of retreat into being a um, mainly an education and outreach organization. That's where I'd like to be, and I believe we will be there in due course. But for the next few years, we're still going to be in the situation where there are projects that have not yet got to the point of investability, even by these very visionary investors. And therefore, the foundation still remains in its role as being, if you like, the engine room of the, of the, um, of, of the industry. Now, you're absolutely right to mention the, the contrast between Sam Foundation and Ajax. Um, in fact, over the whole history of Sense Research Foundation, my take has been that we don't really need to do much stem cell research, even though stem cells and stem cell therapies is, you know, a, a very much a component of Sense. It's one of the seven pillars. Nevertheless, um, I felt, you know, it's not good use of our money, our resources, simply because other people are doing the most important work already, and therefore, and they're getting funding for it out by, from other other sources. And therefore, it would not be a good, you know, bang for our buck. Um, no, that, but then the question, of course, comes up, well, okay, who is doing the most important work? And for sure, Mike West has been right up there at the top of my list for a very long time in that regard. I have a huge amount of admiration for Mike. And even back in the Geron days, when he was first working with the people in Wisconsin, for example, Jamie Thompson um, on embryonic stem cells, you know, there was really important work going on. But it's gone a long way since then. His next company, Advanced Cell Technology, um, was, was able to make really great breakthroughs in terms of the ability to create cells of a, a particular committed lineage that could be used as progenitor cells for therapeutic purposes. And to cut a very long story short, what ended up happening was that Mike started working as the CEO of a new, another company, Biotime, with whom he had already had links for a long time. And now we're in a situation where a subsidiary of Biotime called Ajax, A-G-E-X, was a, um, uh, was created a couple of years ago, and Mike reached out to me, and I was very happy to accept his offer of coming in part time in a vice president position. Um, Ajax is now no longer a subsidiary of Biotime. It was essentially spun out into its own independent form, and it's now actually public. It's floated on the New York Stock Exchange, and it's doing pretty nicely. Um, so what Ajax was able to do was to acquire a lot of the intellectual property from these earlier iterations of Mike West's work. And it's, I believe, going to make a huge difference when it comes to the application of stem cells to, um, uh, to, to, to the problems of aging. There are two main areas that Ajax is pursuing. The first one, which is further along than the other, is something that was originally developed at the previous company of Bone Cell Technology. It's now called Pure Stem. And what Pure Stem is, is a method for creating very highly pure populations of stem cells of a particular type. So I'm sure most of the audience will be aware that it's possible now to make stem cells that are very, very primitive, what are called pluripotent stem cells, starting from so any kind of cell you like, basically by turning the developmental clock backwards and resetting how they are. And these cells are great, but you wouldn't want to inject them because they don't know what to do next. They're too versatile. So they can become a type of cancer called a teratoma. They can do bad things. Um, so what you have to do instead is to essentially re-differentiate these cells, to take them a, a small amount, um, a small distance along forwards along the developmental pathway so that they become what's called oligopotent that means that they can they're still stem cells they can still divide and one of the cells remains a stem cell and the other one starts on its differentiation pathway but they only become a particular type of eventual cell and that's really important so what um, advanced cell technology were able to do and now it's in the hands of ajax was to develop a way to do this reliably. Everybody else, when they try to do this by whatever technique, they produce the cells they want to produce, <clears throat> but 
<coughs> mixed in among the cells they wanted to produce will be a whole bunch of cells that are not what they wanted to produce. Now, the wrong kind of stem cell, or in many cases, and what's most important is some of them will not be differentiated at all. They'll still be in this what's called pluripotent state, which is very dangerous. So you, won't want to inject, you don't want to inject that kind of stuff, and you would never get FDA approval or whatever. Yeah, um, so, <coughs> so pure stem cells that problem. <coughs> Excuse me. The other technology, which, as I say, is less far along, is called ITR, in, in, induced tissue rejuvenation. And what ITR is all about is doing the de-differentiation thing, the creation of pluripotent stem cells, but doing it in the body. Now, other people have looked at this, and they've done it in a rather simplistic way. They have essentially applied the same technologies, the same genes that cause um, that, that, that can create pluripotent cells from normal cells in, the, in, in cell culture, and they've applied them in sophisticated ways in the body. And that's clever, but I don't think it's ever going to be safe because it's going to be too difficult to stop the system from going too far, from creating genuinely pluripotent cells in the body when you don't want them. So what Ajax have been able to do is identify different genes, completely different genes, that are able to uh, de-differentiate, to, to turn the clock back in, this, in these in cells so that they become regenerative, but not to turn them all the way back into pluripotency, only just far enough that they become regenerative and they don't do things like scarring. So as I say, this is at a relatively early stage, but it's going quite nicely. Fantastic. Well, I've had a couple of questions from the audience so far. And um, at this point, what would you say, since like there has been progress on a number of fronts, for instance, uh, the intercellular cross-linking and, and the, um, sorry, the extracellular cross-linking, the mitochondrial mutations and that, that stuff you just mentioned, what do you think is the hardest to solve now? And what do you see as being the biggest problems moving forward into the 2020s and 2030s, if you can see that far, if you can have a guess at that? Well, I'm delighted to say that that's actually a really hard question to answer right now, because the fact is everything's moving fast. The most difficult areas, I mean, MitoSense is a great example. We started working on mitochondrial mutations in the mid 2000s, so more than 10 years ago, no, 15 years, almost 15 years ago. And for 11 of those years, we had made so little progress that we didn't even have any publications to show for it. And now, things are completely different. We published a paper just over two years ago showing a, one really big breakthrough. And we're in the process of preparing a couple more papers right now, uh, talking about what's happened in the meantime. Essentially, well, I wouldn't say we've solved the problem, but we're getting mighty close. We've, got, we've made huge advances over the past two years, you know, far more than what we achieved in the previous 11 years. So, you know, I can't really say that that's a, a hugely difficult problem anymore. It's certainly difficult, but it's not nearly as difficult as it seemed to be a couple of years ago. Then, you know, and the same applies for cross-linking. Um, as I say, this has now been spun out into a company. There's still plenty of work to do. We're funding a group in, the, in England, actually, looking for additional aspects of that problem, new types of chemical structure, new types of cross-link that may have been overlooked in the past. But that's going pretty well, too. Nothing's really cropped up that is giving us cause for concern. Um, so, you know, I believe at this point, most of the job is done. We have... First of all, great progress in the laboratory. Second of all, we've got this enormous progress in terms of investment enthusiasm for all of this. And you know, a huge number of companies coming along, not only our own spin outs, but also other companies that are aligned with us doing very sensible work, as, I, as we like to say, sense like work um, on damage repair. And of course, I work with those companies as well, not only with our own startups, to ensure that they get investment as well as possible and as quickly as possible. So I'm really happy. And this is the kind of reason why I am quite you know, bullish about my time frames now, why I've been saying recently that robust mass rejuvenation may be less than five years away and um, you know, robust human rejuvenation, longevity, escape velocity may be only maybe 18 years away, not 25 anymore. Fantastic. Yes. Well, that's something I'm certainly looking forward to. And I'm sure a lot of people listening in at the moment are too. So yeah, fantastic. Um, well, 
what actually Kelsey Moody is somebody I met um, who we used to do a little bit of um, like a volunteering for the uh, for the Methuselah Foundation back in the day. Um, so yeah, I've heard he's been doing some pretty good stuff. Is there anything you'd like to say about his work? Sure. Yeah. So you know, I have a <clears throat> over the years I've been able to to bring um, to bring forward a succession of proteges people who have moved, moved moved on and done really enormous stuff for this mission in their own right. And Kelsey is one of the most important ones. He first came to us back in 2008, and he was still an undergrad in upstate New York back then. He wanted to do something for youngsters. He wanted to start an education initiative. And initially, we had no money to speak of, but we had enough money to pay him a little bit so that he didn't have to work 20 hours a week at Radio Shack, which is where he was at the time. Um, and he was able to create the beginnings of our education initiative, which is now a hugely successful thing, mostly focused on internships, summer internships. We take in a dozen or more people, both in our own lab and in a bunch of other labs each year. And it's um, one of the world's most respected internship programs. It's oversubscribed by a factor of 50 every year. So pretty good news. Uh, that all started with Kelsey. Um, Kelsey also, at another point during the past decade, he helped to start our work on ALT, on the telomerase independent telomere uh, lengthening, which is, of course, an area that was pioneered in Australia by um, Roger Riddell in Sydney. Um, uh, and so, yeah, he's been enormous. But what he's doing now is he's running this company called ICOR, I-C-H-O-R, which started out as a macular generation company. Basically, we let him run with the work that we had been pursuing for the previous decade or more on eliminating the waste products that accumulate in the back of the eye and that drive this thing, macular degeneration, which is the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. So that was the first thing that ICOR was pursuing, and it's done it very well. <coughs> They've now got quite substantial funding to take that forward into clinical trials. But <clears throat> it's no longer the only thing that ICOR does. In fact, what ICOR has done is they've created a, a bunch of subsidiaries. So now there's a, a subsidiary company called Lysoclear, which is pursuing that part. But they've also got another subsidiary called Antoxerine, which is pursuing a, a, a new approach to getting rid of senescent cells. As we talked about earlier, a very you know, popular area in... Um, in rejuvenation biotechnology. That's also been very well funded by investors. On top of that, they do a lot of CRO work, a lot of essentially contract work for other people. And because they're doing well, they don't have to take any old contract work. They specifically work with people who are very mission focused. You know, they're all about fixing aging and the sense approach. So yeah, Kelsey is a phenomenon. He is absolutely one of my most successful people absolutely yes um well uh great uh that we've got a we should we need more kelsey moody's in the world perhaps but uh, look uh, there's a conference coming up in berlin undoing aging and that's been a hugely successful conference series so far um i thought it would be good to spruik that while we were doing this interview um, and also, if you'd like to highlight any of the interesting areas of focus that this con this conference will be dealing with, sure, yes. So, um, <clears throat> yes. So, undoing undoing aging is happening in Berlin on the March the twenty eighth through thirtieth, and as you say, it is the um, next in a series which began last year. Um, we had had the same thing in Berlin um, a year ago. Um, of course, this hello. Wasn't it two I years? Know. I thought it was two years before, like already. No, no, no. We, this is the second one coming up. Um, the, um, the what, 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 what we can say though is that these conferences in Berlin are really a resumption of the conference series that I ran a long time ago, starting back in two thousand and three in Cambridge. They're very much science focused. There's nothing about you know advocacy or well, not much anyway, and, or or um, you know. Uh, the um, private sector or anything. It's really just focused on the science. But um, it's very much the same kind of thing that I used to do in Cambridge. The conferences are not quite so long. They're only two and a, two, day, well, two and a half days rather than three and a half. 
but we're having them every year, so that kind of you know compensates. And just as we did in Cambridge, these conferences are very diverse. They cover absolutely every aspect of science, all of the damage repair approaches um, and new ways of going about them. And of course, we bring in the most prestigious world leading speakers. So um, <clears throat> we actually, you know, are highlighting this in our newsletter every week. There's a, a little feature on one or more, or one, one or two of the speakers that are coming. So I definitely would not want to highlight any particular speaker or any particular theme because there isn't one. We're doing it across the board. And that's really what the strength of this meeting is. The diversity, the cross-pollination, and the opportunity for new collaborations to emerge. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, um, now you, you did attend a conference uh, early in January you were talking to me about and you said there might be some interesting um, uh, sort of newsworthy items coming out of that, the Juvenescence JP Morgan event that happened. Um, yeah, I, I'm not yeah. really, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I don't, I wasn't, I didn't attend that conference. Can you just give the highlight of what, what you think was worth? Sure, yeah, so, so I didn't actually just attend that conference, I ran it. <clears throat> so Juvenescence, as you um, may know, is a really powerful, really important investment vehicle that is supporting a, already a, 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 quite a number of the most important startups in this field. It is the brainchild of just a couple of people, both very wealthy billionaire level investors. One of them, a guy named Jim Mellon from the UK, and another one, a guy named uh, Greg Bailey from, um, from Los Angeles. They hooked up with a great friend of theirs named Declan Dugan, who is originally from Scotland, uh, but who has lived in the US a long time and who um, used to be a very senior executive at Pfizer. And the three of them were able to create this thing, Juvenescence, which is focused on, ver on precisely the work that we do. And of course, they reached out to me at a very early stage a couple of years ago, and I work with them extremely closely. So um, a year ago, what they decided to do was to run a little one-day meeting of let's just um, just um, a, a very small thing for maybe 50 people um, in a restaurant in San Francisco. And it was organized as a satellite meeting to a really big conference that's organized by the Merchant Bank, JP Morgan, every year in San Francisco, which is focused on biotech investment. So um, <clears throat> the idea of this thing was to uh, showcase a few of the most promising rejuvenation biotechnology startups and to expose them to other investors. One of the wonderful things about Juvenescence is that Jim and Greg and Deck are not just in this to make money and to, you know, to, 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 to you know, to, to, to grab everything. They want to build the entire sector. They want to actually get other investors involved because they know that the more investors are involved, the bigger the sector will be and they will profit that way. And so they created this thing. They asked me to run it and it was spectacularly successful. It was like we, we had room for about 30 or 40 people to sit down, but there was more than 100 people in the, in the room. So it was, it was quite amazing. And so, of course, what they decided to do was to do it again this past year, um, just a month ago, a month and a half ago. And um, again, they got me to run it. And we did a, it was somewhat bigger. Um, we had maybe 150 seats. But again, it was totally standing remotely. It was totally overrun. And it was the same deal. You know, at this point, as you can imagine, the industry has grown so much just in those 12 months that I'm underwater. You know, I'm not, I'm not really able to say anymore that I know everybody who matters. You know, people, new companies are coming along every week that are doing very valuable, very important stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm spending most of my time just making introductions, you know, just making sure that these people have the opportunity to talk to the right potential sources of money. So yes, I mean, this, it was an enormous success. I'm sure we'll do it every year going forward and it's going to get bigger and bigger. And you know, it, 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 it's, it's enormously heartening to me, both personally to be able to, you know, to leverage my own status in the field, <clears throat> but also in terms of being able to help these organizations, these companies, these investors to work together to hasten the defeat of aging. Fantastic. 
sometimes I take a little while because I've got unused. Now, um, so yes, uh, uh, somebody from the audience uh, asked, uh, I th uh, by, by his name, he sounds like he may be from China himself. He asked them whether uh, there's been any interesting re uh, research done in China um, as well as in the United States. And now, there was a um, a very there was some gene sort of therapy that hit the news, um, and somebody got in big trouble because of it too. Um, but yes, you, you, do you want to uh, um, discuss that? Um, sure, and yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So of course, China has um, you know a lot of differences from the West in terms of attitudes to what's acceptable and what's desirable and so on. Um, but of course, they've got a huge amount of money and a huge amount of you know, technological sophistication. So I believe that China is going to play an enormous part in bringing rejuvenation technology into reality. So far, I've got to say, they're lagging behind. They, they're in catch-up mode. They, I, I think it's not just China. The whole of Asia has, I think, a, um, a mindset challenge, a mindset problem that doesn't exist to the same extent in the West. Namely, they need to understand, they need to be able to think about aging as a medical problem. And that's very difficult for Asian cultures in general, <clears throat> because <clears throat> essentially they have this respect for the elderly, very strong, very, very you know, powerful respect, but it's the wrong kind of respect. It's a respect that actually makes it difficult for them to think of aging as a medical problem. Uh, they're getting over that now, progressively. Stem cell research especially is moving forward pretty fast now in, in China and elsewhere. And it's, um, as you say, you know, proving to be not completely smooth. Um, there are examples where people are doing things that other people say they shouldn't be doing. But hey, you know, that's what you expect with, different, with diversity of cultures. Um, and I, I will say, I want to give a real shout out here to Singapore who have made the extremely smart move of hiring my good friend Brian Kennedy to run this very um, you know, promising and prestigious center for healthy life extension in, in Singapore. I believe that, that that's going to be a massive global player in this area right now, and that Singapore is going to lead Asia into actually catching up, actually becoming a, becoming a true partner in the crusade against aging. Brian is a really smart, really visionary guy. Uh, he's not just visionary, he's really energetic. He's dynamic. He knows exactly how to deal with the people that he needs to deal with in order to bring the most amount of money and effort and enthusiasm and expertise into all of this. So um, he and I are obviously you know, communicating a lot to make sure that everything works well. Great, that sounds really promising. I've got a couple of friends in Singapore who would be very pleased to hear that. Um, now, yes, I um, got sort of um, alerted to the idea of, uh, 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 to Josh Middledorf's posts um, and Harold Catch's uh, ideas. And there seems to be quite a number of murmurings around his approach to um, aging, uh, reducing uh, the, the damage of aging. Um, now, I'm just wondering if you've follow, followed his stuff. Um, yep. he's had some, you, you and him had some disagreements in the past, I believe, about the, the philosophy of it all. But what well, about what of, is work? Yeah, it's not really a philosophical difficulty, a difference. Um, so, Harold, you know, I'm not really sure whether Harold really understands what is really going on here. Because when he's spoken to me about his work that you're talking about, that he's been doing with Josh and with these in, this Indian group, he has he seems to think that it's somehow in conflict with the way that I think about aging, when it's not remotely in conflict. He's really just doing totally mainstream stuff, looking at the impact of young blood on the uh, on the aging body. And this is, of course, work that we are completely in line with. We've funded some of the most important um, research in this area ourselves in, in the Convoy Lab over the years. So, um, you know, I'm, I, th I think I need to talk to Harold a bit more to get him to understand that actually I don't have a problem at all with what he's doing. With regard to the specific results that he's had, well, as, as with any scientific work, one needs to look at the details, 
you know, he sent me some of the data, but I've got a bunch of questions and I haven't had time to have enough of a conversation there to come to a firm opinion about whether they're onto, onto anything new. But what I can say certainly is that I'm happy that he's doing this work. I'm happy that he's been able to forge these collaborations and, you know, more power to him. Good luck. Right. So, um, okay, well, I guess we will just wait and see. And um, there, there's been a lot of talk about the success, the preliminary successes they've been having. But um, I, I don't know if all the data has been released publicly yet or whether it's been peer reviewed properly. Uh, but yeah, I'm certainly interested to, to see what happens. Now, Adam, before you go on, I just got to tell you, I've only got 10 more minutes. I've got to, I've got to run after that. Oh, great. No worries. But it's been fantastic so far. So yes. Um, well, is there any specific uh, developments um, in the overall uh, rejuvenation biotechnology um, arena that you'd like to focus on before you go? I think the main thing I would like to highlight is the fact that the um, societal and um, you know political components of the problem of fixing aging are also beginning to see good progress. People often say, well, yeah, okay, scientific community is coming around, progress is being made in the laboratories, we're getting you know, uh, closer in terms of technicalities, but it's still going to be a hell of a long time before anybody actually sees the benefit of all of this, because, you know, there's the FDA, there's, the other, there's all these organizations that provide obstacles to all of it. I want to make sure people understand that that's not really a good characterization of where things are right now. The FDA, and of course its counterparts around the world, are keen to save lives. They are not the bad guys. They are really trying to modernize their way of looking at the issues of ill health in a way that is consistent with the science. And that has led, of course, to um, progress. Uh, I, I've highlighted in the past the TAME trial, this trial of metformin, which has been um, designed specifically to work on aging. Aging is still not a condition which, in, you know, in those terms, in those words, is recognized by the FDA as something that a drug can be used for. But that's OK now because what they've done instead is they've created a language, a form of words that is equivalent to aging in everything but name. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the end point for the time trial. So even if the time trial fails, or even if it never actually happens, which is quite possible because it's only 50% funded at this point, still, the FDA is no longer a problem in that regard. I also want to highlight the way in which we incentivize big pharma, big companies, to put the effort in to develop technologies against aging. This is something that, again, has been a big obstacle over the years. But now, with the release of the new ICD codes, we have the concept of a, what's called an extension code called aging related, which can be applied to any other code, any kind of actual disease, and which will powerfully incentivize uh, big pharma to get involved because it will mandate, it will actually require physicians to prescribe drugs to anyone over 65 that have been approved with that code rather than um, with, uh, you know, without that code. So that's, that's actually a really important development. And there's much more than that. Behind the scenes, you've got a lot of progress being made, a lot of improvement in the sophistication and the understanding of all of this in um, both Big Pharma, uh, the whole of the medical industry, the insurance world, the pensions world. You know, I get a lot of invitations to speak to groups like that. And, you know, I've been getting those invitations for a decade or two. And historically, it was rather frustrating. I got the impression that they weren't really listening, but now they're definitely listening. So, yeah, I'm very happy. I'm very heartened. Fantastic. Yes, I should um, spend a little moment to blow my own trumpet. I focused on this particular issue, at least partially, in the video which I did for the Longevity Film Competition, which actually won, which I'm very glad to say. Um, yeah, well, a lot of work that was really good. In that. Yeah, um, I got a lot of good feedback. And I want to, 
I do want to extend that idea um, and turn it into a full documentary at some stage. Um, yes, so if there's any people out there, professional edit, um, producers, people with broadcast quality gear, um, with funds who want to help with that, then that would be fantastic. Just, um, yeah, just putting it out there. Um, and contact me if you can. Now, um, yeah, it is amazing. I think the World Health Organization have highlighted that there is population issues with an, um, the increasing aging population there that that I was um, arguing may be able to be mitigated slightly with the with um, foundational research in aging. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to see that because you know, like it seems there'll be a, a huge economic burden as well as you know the ethical burden in the amount of suffering created by such a thing. Um, because of this uh, um, aging population issue in at various places around the world, so yeah, is that something like yeah? What what are your thoughts on the arguments for um, yeah, I mean, doing it, it, aging? Yeah. This is absolutely right. I mean, people <clears throat> people are still being incredibly slow to understand what the work we're doing actually is for. They think, oh God we're going to have more old people. And of course, we are going to have more chronologically old people, but we're going to have far fewer biologically old people. And that needs to be understood that, 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 that those things do not are not going to be linked anymore. And ultimately, it's having a lot of biologically old people that's the problem. And that's the problem we're solving. Fantastic. Well, um, look, it's been fan really great having you again, Aubrey, and it's always great to hear about the progress it sends and, and other areas, um, and also the Ajax Therapeutics. Uh, and it really, um, it seems as though the industry, the regenerative medicine industry is going gangbusters. Uh, and it's great to see that, like, your your estimations on, uh, for instance, when robust okay. uh, mouse rejuvenation therapy will be achieved is is um, getting smaller and smaller. And that's what we'd like to see. Um, and yeah. also, like, great to see even more funding is coming in. I, I see that um, uh, Vitalik has also donated a lump sum again. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so that's amazing. Um, and I am certainly confident and hopeful that these things will continue. So you're doing great work. It's great to catch up with you again. And we're all behind you, Aubrey, and keep on doing the good the good thing. It's really good to, to watch you with all the energy that you have uh, focused on this. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And of course, I do want to emphasize that you're doing fantastic work here as well. You know, your efforts are definitely not to be forgotten. Thank you so much. Well, um, who knows, I might see you. Are you going to be in Berlin this year? Of course, I'm running it. Okay, right. hopefully I'll see you in Berlin if I can get there. Not in not right. too long way. All right. Very good. You. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in and, and uh, submitting questions. They've been great. And if you enjoyed this, consider subscribing, liking the video, and letting people know about it. Cheers. Thanks very much. It's been wonderful.